Welcome. Welcome and blessings to you. It's a joy to see you here, those gathered here this morning, and a special greeting, special greeting to those joining us on Zoom this morning. We hope that you find this time together uplifting, that you experience God's love and the warmth of God's saving grace. We begin with our call to worship on this Reformation Sunday, acknowledging our brokenness and our frailty and our reliance on the Almighty. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the Judeans who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be. You will be free indeed. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you on this uh, Reformation Sunday. There have been various Reformations throughout history where subgroups have uh, dissented and formed splinter groups, and there's offshoots, of course. Every year about this time, though, we, along with many other Protestant faith traditions, celebrate the Reformation occurring in the 1500s. The 1500s, that Reformation was about worship, about life, living lives as beloved children of the Almighty. Oh yes, there was that grace component too, you all may know about. The acknowledgement and living into the idea of our inability to do anything that will make God love us more or make God love us less. Salvation is a gift, not something we earn or hope to earn. Unconditional love from the Almighty, from our Creator. This Sunday will not be a history lesson on the Reformation occurring in the 1500s. Oh, I see some frowns out there. <laughs> this isn't sleep time uh, and history lesson time. 
for a different time. It's exciting what's happening during the Reformation, Mo what motivates people, how they act, how they interact, how they react. It's a large, wonderful story, stories, but for another time and not for the sermon. But do please note two important things. Many theologians were a part of this Reformation during the 1500s. There was Luther, of course, woohoo, Martin Luther. We know him well. But there was also Bishop in um, the Alsace-Lorraine area. There was Calvin in, in the Geneva area. There was Zwingli in the Zurich area, Zurich, Switzerland. Melanchthon, John Knox, and many, many more, many more theologians contributing contributing to this Reformation and the, phrase, and the faith uh, traditions that exist today. That's point one. Many were involved in this Reformation. Second point is most of these reformers were looking to reform from within. They weren't out to start a new religion. They wanted to do it from within, make suggestions to the powers that be, the administration, the church organization, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, have you considered this? We should, we should be looking at this. According to the Bible, this is, so they were making commentary suggestions, advocating for policy and worship, et cetera, et cetera, from within. They weren't out here again to start a new religion. We can discuss later in the story time about the Reformation. Um, Let's move on to our text for, for today in, in the Reformation Sunday. Last week, we had James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Remember those two? Pick me, pick me, Jesus. Pick me. And Jesus' response said, yeah, that's wonderful. Keep that kind of energy up. But if you want to be great, what that greatness looks like, Jesus redefines greatness for us, for them and for us as well. Serving. Greatness is found in serving. Everyone can be great under that definition. And we also looked at um, God's response to Job. We were in last week in chapter 38. This week we're in chapter 42, the last chapter in the book of Job. Uh, we looked at how up till this point, we've um, God has been listening to Job's laments and his complaints and his on and on and on. And now finally in 38, God responds. Today, today, here again, we're, we have Job, uh, we're in the 42nd chapter, the last chapter. And as I shared last Sunday, too, there's lots of different concurrent themes going on, running through the book of Job. Last week, we explored the wonder that God is a conversational God. How wonderful that is. It's not a dismissive God, one who puts his fingers in his ear after, after God creates, et cetera, et cetera. But God participates in creation, continues to participate in cre creation, a conversational God. Job has, the book of Job shows this, demonstrates this. There's also the theme of the complexity and absurd, absurdity of suffering in the world. It addresses that theme as well. And our human quest to grasp it, its causes and meaning of all the suffering that does exist in the world. Another theme is uh, about who's in control. In other words, that which I am, is that solely my doing? Look at me. Look at what I've created for myself. Or is there something larger going on with me in creation? Another theme is God's response. Uh, if God is responsible for good, is God also responsible for bad, the bad stuff that happens? Lots of different themes going on in Job. Over the years, I've been in conversation with folks about their trials and tribulations. These are faith-rooted folks. They continue to ask the hard questions, and I think maybe we all do as well, ask the hard questions of themselves and the Creator about suffering, about life, about our existence and participation in the greater creation. Trying to make meaning out of it. If the book of Job is about human suffering, it's also about the ways we try to make meaning of it, this human suffering. Job suffers trauma, as we talked about last week, and misery before he finally speaks directly to Jesus. Much of the book is his is complaining, and then he goes to Jesus, to not Jesus, to God. He goes to God. 
and says, look, what's going on here? And starts complaining to God. I think that for Job and for us, that's what makes the difference. That's the turning point in the book of Job and our lives. Job seeks counsel. Realizes it's something beyond himself. Doesn't try to do it on his own. Steps into, if you will, a vulnerability. Like, I don't have this figured out. I need to understand. I want to understand. He goes to God. He, he lives into the reliance on God. Into conversational God. A God we can have conversation with. God replies in this week's passage. We hear Job's response to God's list of things only the creator can understand. Although, God, I don't know, it's, it, you have to kind of read the whole last few chapters to maybe pick this up. But although God has demanded that Job be quiet and be listening while God speaks, Job isn't quiet. I like that. God kind of, okay, this dance. So have you ever had a conversation where somebody keeps interrupting you or has a propensity to interrupt you? Like, oh, well, what? That, that, and, and this back and forth, this very human, if you will, conversation Job has with the divine. I love that. Job answers God again by showing up, declaring great faith. We hear this in Job's response, his interruption, if you will. I have ordered what I did not understand, he says, things too wonderful, wonderful for me that I did not know. Job's recognition of his lack of understanding is a not dismissive sort of, okay, whatever it is, it is what it is. It's not, I don't think that at all. Job realizes and admits, acknowledges that he is indeed not God, but created by God. By internalizing Job, by internalizing and speaking about his condition, Job, Job demonstrates active faith, that suffering isn't what God had intended for his life. In doing so, provides needed perspective about his own human condition. This is Job now. I am not God, so I have little power over the rising of the sun. I'm paraphrasing here, but Job realizes that he's not God and has little power over the rising of the sun, if you will, or the setting of the sun or where the wind blows. Job is humbly in conversation with God, praising the creator, acknowledging the creator's magnificence, seeking answers also, growing in understanding as a, of his own existence in creation. And Job is growing in awareness. And as Job is going, growing in awareness, he's being reformed. He grows in his realization of his connectedness to God, reliance on the ways of the Almighty for a rich and meaningful life. Job goes through a reformation not once, but continuously, as he has conversation with God. Moving to the gospel from John this morning. In our gospel for today, Jesus talks about freedom. We refer to the gospel, this good news we have come to know in Jesus Christ in a variety of ways. What's the good news? If I ask the question, we would come up with lots of different, different answers. The good news is our, the good news of, of our salvation, of God's mercy, of God's forgiveness, of life eternal. And today, Jesus uses the word freedom. The good news, characterized by freedom. An interesting theme. The connection, I think, be, between the words that we use here, the words I shared, and the words you may uh, share as being the good news, I think inherently there's a assumed need. Let me unfold that, unpack that. I, a need by us for mercy, for example. We have a merciful God. We're in the need of mercy. We have a forgiving God. We have a God who shows us grace, undeserving love. God's forgiveness comes to us as a gift. God's mercy comes to us, those in need of mercy. The one who values salvation knows that he or she needs the saving, right? The one who to whom grace is important is always 
is, is the one who's aware of their need for grace. If you don't realize or want grace, then you have no need for it. And you don't appreciate that gift of unconditional love. Forgiveness implies our sinful behavior. It's that realization. In our gospel text, there are those who struggle with Jesus' words. There are some that kind of push back on what Jesus is saying about freedom. So you can imagine those encountering Jesus in today's gospel offended as they say, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. Sort of like, you know, I got it all together. I'm in control. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? <laughs> Many commentaries on this subject suggest that have they forgotten about the Assyrians, the Assyrian captivity with, with which they were slaves to, or the Babylonians, or the, the, the Egyptians? And they're living under Roman uh, rule right now. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. I borrowed that one. That wasn't mine. No praise, no glory being given. They push aside their connection and relationship with their creation and the creator. Don't need that stuff. They push aside the interconnectedness, the, their reliance, their need to rely on the almighty one. They refuse to be reformed. With regard to creation, I think we need to be a part of it. And it needs us as well to be a part of it. See that relationship, the give and take, the partnership, if you will, to be a part of creation God has made. I need you and you need me. We dance together in this delightful creation as we come to know one another and our loving creator. For those in the gospel text this morning, the forgiven person really can't live into that forgiveness if they are unwilling to grow in the awareness of their destructive behavior, their destructive acts, their sin against God and others. If they're not aware or admitting to, they can't receive that gift or they struggle or push back against that gift. Looking at the characters in the gospel today and with Job, is there a takeaway? Maybe you've already picked up on some takeaways from this, but maybe we too find ourselves in denial. Sometimes I do. I got it all together. I am in control of this situation. And my frustration grows when things go, go awry <laughs> because, darn it, I thought I had control of this. I am a self-made person. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made up my mind. What is this called? A sort of a, American frontier mentality. I don't need anybody. I don't need to rely on anybody but myself. This sort of thinking, I think, moves us away from the Almighty and our brothers and sisters we are traveling with on this journey, on this third rock from the sun we call the earth. Moves us from growing in the awareness of our need for grace, our need for forgiveness, and our need for mercy. Just as Job, we are called to be in a reforming mode as we honestly admit that we aren't perfect, that our lives aren't perfect. And there's room not just for growth and improvement, but also for help, repentance, and forgiveness and mercy from our creator. I know it can be hard. Today, there's much cultural pressure, cultural pressure to act as if we got it together. We're pretty much all together. I got a great job. I got a great life. Great relationships. Great future. What a pressure into to, to standing strong and, and sharing all that. Siblings in Christ, let us always be mindful. Be mindful of our creator, our approachable God, our conversational God, who loves and cares for us. One we can praise and glory, glorify and give thanks to. One we can go to to express our hurts, our pain, our suffering, just as Job did. And one we can acknowledge also our shortcomings and our sinfulness. And as we do, receive mercy, receive forgiveness and guidance to navigate the world in which we live. Hallelujah. Blessings to you on this Reformation Sunday. May you continually be reformed. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.